I came to Prayer Harvey. I sat for a little while after that, and all of a sudden, I see Eric coming inside, Bey Gavri. And the group of people with him that were sitting there and learning, you could see everyone, once he came inside, everyone's face lit up. It was like, it was straight up like an angel coming inside, and everyone, all of a sudden, they were happy, they are saying, how's, ev how's everything, Eric? You're awesome, let's learn. And you see Eric was full of passion, full of Torah, ready to learn and ready to do anything possible to make everyone happy. That was a small thing that I knew him for, and Mizrat Hashem, that Eric should see from Shemaim and Gan Eden, that everyone here learning in his merit should always grow in Torah, in his name, and in their, in, in own, their own successes, Mizrat Hashem. And? Just quickly, I wanted to tell all you guys. The program tonight, as you saw on the flyer, there is Rabbi Yitzchak Aminov, Rabbi Vaknin, Avi Benjamin. This here is a little surprise for everybody. Let me explain to you how the program is going to work tonight. After we're done with this, Rabbi Vaknin is going to be introduced. He's going to come up on the stage. After Rabbi Vaknin, we're going to introduce this short film. This film is a 15, 16, 20 minute video about Eric, Eric's life, Eric's friends talking about him. Just a little thing for his memorial so that people who don't even know who he was that are in this room, that are here just for the Shiro Torah, will actually, you know, get to know the guy. And the people that do know him, this is a reminder of who Eric used to be and uh, his, you know, memorial video. After that, we're going to be introducing Rabbi Yitzchak Aminov, and Avi Benjamin will take it away from there and inspire all of us, and that will be the night. So, ready to introduce? So, without further ado, Rabbi Asher Rachman, we'd like to invite you to the stage to inspire us all. And uh, I, once again, thank you everyone for coming. I will devote Torah tonight. It's going to be the new Nishmat. Family members, our brothers, um, Eric Yitzchak Ben Maya, Rafael. Uh, Rafael, Almighty God will give you a long and healthy and happy life. Mrs. Maya, you are a righteous woman. When we're searching in, in this world for Tzadikim, to get a blessing from a woman like you is guaranteed to be successful. You are a righteous woman in this world. You know, how that my brother said, everybody's busy to go to Kivot Tzadikim. But sometimes sometime you can meet a life Tzadik. You don't have to go all the way to Israel. And Mrs. Maya, you are one of them. Uh, raising your son and your daughters. Um, and such a dedication, such a sacrifice. I mean, you know, we're complaining over so much nonsense. A person is getting ticket and is kind and depression. Why bad things happen to good people? And we always come in against. Uh, you're going out on a date and the date was not working, we're complaining. We lost a job, we're complaining. We don't have iPhone number 12 or again, I'm number 13, we're complaining. We always complaining. And to see a woman like you in our generation is to see Tzadikit. A woman that accepts whatever God gave, any gift, and raising and put her life aside. You know how difficult it's so easy to run away from a hyper obstacle? This is what 90% of us do. When we have obstacle, the best thing is running away. If I want to invite you to speak, most of you will run away from the place. Why we have to face? <coughs> My son asked me, hey, Abba, what's the, secret, what's the secret to speak in front of a crowd? How do I know that I'm ready to get married? How did I know? How did I know that I'm ready to be a speaker? I said, you will never know. Get married and then you're gonna get to know. When they invite me the first time to speak in front, for, for, in front of 500 people, it's ready, we never run away. I saw in the IDF, we see fire, we're not only not running away, we're coming into the fire. Let's welcome to Israel. We're facing a challenge in a whole different way. Mrs. Maya, the way that you face the obstacle and the gift that God gave you, he was heroic, heroic. You are a righteous woman in our generation. And the Almighty God will bless you in this world and in the world to come for everything that you did. Our community admire you. You are a role model in our community. Thank you very much for being who you are. This is the beginning. I 
I was thinking about it. What exactly I'm going to say? So I'm going to give you, I'm going to try to make it short because we already start late. So I'm going to give you a few ideas. The first one is, Eric Yitzchak in my eyes symbolize unity. Unity meaning achdut. You know why it symbolizes achdut? Because just Alex Matatov uh, told me, Rabbi Vaklin, they have the rabbi from Emet, the rabbi from Chazak. You are in the BJCC, Yot Minyan Torah Flow, the place to be. We have uh, Rabbi Amino from other synagogues. We have Rabbi Kaziyov. There are so many rabbinim that came from all over, from any spectrum, and we all unity to under the same roof. Only Eric had the ability to do it. Because he went to any place with no politician, with no Janganuzis, with no hearing bad or speaking bad, he was there. You see, in Pesach, what's the secret of Lela Seder? We start Lela Seder with what? Karpas. What do we do with Karpas? We take the Karpas and we dip in. Right after, after that, what do we do, Magid? We start the story of the Agadah. We finish Lela Seder with Maror. I don't know if you ever heard. The first message of tonight is the most beautiful one. Do you know why we dip in with Karpas? Kar? Pass. Kar and Aramit is a clothing. Pass is a striped clothing. That any, any of you remember what is the symbolizer of striped clothing mentioned? Which Sadiq in our history had a clothing stripe that made so much balagan? Who is it? Yosef a Sadiq. And why that he was so much balagan? Because he was baseless hate. Brothers that sold other brothers. How do we finish the seder? When we take maro and we surround the maro with what? With matzah, korech, and we put cement, the haru said to stick. Maru, it's, uh, matzah symbolized the tzaddik. Maru symbolized the rasha. And the haru said symbolized the stick. If a tzaddik and a rasha can live under the same roof, then you can start your chanurik. We start the agada by reminding ourselves we, we went into Egypt because of baseless hate. We're going to leave Egypt because of baseless love. We start with Karpas and we finish with Korech. Karpas symbolized the hate. Korech symbolized the love. Eric Festival symbolized to all of us the unity, the shalom, the peace between a husband and wife, children and parents, friends, rabbis, in communities. Enough with the nonsense. Enough with the politician. Enough with this, this synagogue is righteous and the other synagogue and this rabbi is enough. And he put two tefillin and he deep in the mikveh 80 times and the other rabbi deep only 20 times because of that. And he's, that, he's Kabbalist and he's moving like this in that film. All this nonsense have to stop. Do we need to come into Yeshua to remind ourselves how important it is to be unity? How important is to put aside all this nonsense? Eric tonight symbolizes all of us. The power of unity. If Ahmed Chazak and you're in the center can make an event together. My name is Rabbi Yashov Aknin and I approve this message. The greatest message to have. Clap the hand, Ahmed. Clap the hand. No, I'm not running to office. We stuck, and the next four years we still stuck, so just for you to know, I'm practicing. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, repeat after me. Pesach. Pesach. Matzah. Matzah. Maru. Maru. These three things symbolize Eric life. Pesach. What is Pesach is all about? These three, three words that you have to say in the center. Pesach stands for what? The Kotzke Rebbe write amazing. אם אני אני בגלל מי שאני, ואתה אתה בגלל מי שאתה, אז אני אני ואתה אתה. Freedom is to be who you are, and not to be copy. 95%, no offense, of this crowd is a copy pest. You see, we dress the same shoes. All of us have either makash or makashko, or musnakel, all of us the same musnakel, or the same makash, because we have to be a copy paste. The same form, we speak alike, we do the same bar mitzvah, and the same wedding exactly. We spend more or less the same money, even if we don't have. 
And not only that, when we build the house, all of us have the same Bukharian molding. Did you realize when you go, our life? No, I'm sorry, I'm not doing Jagannuzi, I'm just saying Emet. You hear Israeli rabbi, you're gonna hear Emet. 90% of our decision is copy-paste. The Kotzke Rebbe right? what is Pesach is all about? Eric was unique. That one nobody can take from him. He was unique in the way that he spoke, in the way that he dressed, in the way that he shared whatever he had to, without trying to please anyone, without trying, without trying to be a politically correct person. This is me, and accept me for who I am. How many of us, when we go out on a date, we are honest? Suddenly in a date, we're so politically correct, we speak so nice, we never get upset, we never get mad, we eat with fork and knife, oh la la, suddenly our English become refined English, perhaps, when exactly are you using perhaps in your house? When exactly you eat in your house, a Bukharian Jew eat in the house with fork and knife? We have five forks, five knives, may God bless America, and you eat, the hospital like this, with the hand. Suddenly, in the date, you put even the papillon, you know, you put these things, and you eat so nice. How many of us in life fake? Ladies and gentlemen, copy will always gonna be copy. You see, China export and copy. Our life is to become original. If I am I, because the gift of God that gave me, to be unique in my life, I don't have to be copy. Somebody said, Rabbi Vakni, why you have to get excited to push the button? What? Relax. Speak nicely. I said, but this is not me. I'm full of fire. You like it or not? This is me. We're Israelis. We're not trying to please no one. We're trying to get as many Jews closer to Hashem Bach. This is the goal. How do we do it? Each rabbi have his own style, his own view. Don't copy. Don't try to be copies. Stop wearing a coat to drive in a car that you don't like only because everybody else likes it. You drive a car, choose your own car. You should choose a job enough to give the world to decide how you're going to live. You have no money to make a fancy weddings? Don't make a fancy weddings. Why do you have to spend a hundred thousand to, to impress someone that anyway doesn't like you and anyway is going to talk bad about you after that? No, it was only 18 salad, not 26. The, the, the alcohol was only 18 years and anyway they're going to speak. Why all our life we're busy to please others? Be you are. God gave each one of you a gift. Some of you have the ability to speak. Some of you have, have the ability to be a chazan. You will never see me standing chazan because I know I'm not a good chazan. One time I tried, it was a hundred people in the room. When I finished the tefillah, only ten left. Where are the ninety people? They ran away. I know my voice is not good for chazanot. I will never try to be chazan. I'm not good for it. God gave each one of us a certain blessing. Take the blessing of God, serve God in a better way, serve the world in a better way, and be real. Be you. Eric was real. Knowing Eric, taking Eric almost every week to Shiur, he was real. Real. You see what you get. You get what you see. That's it. Be real. Pesach. Pesach reminds us. The courts can have the right. What is freedom? Freedom is to be who you are. How many times I heard ladies, ladies, for the young ladies here, Rabbi, after I'm going to get married, I'm going to change my husband. If you want to change your husband, get married with yourself. It's much more easy. You're not going to get upset. Why do you have to change him? To play? I don't understand. The second date when I went out with my wife before I proposed, it took two dates. When you see a good diamonds, one thing I saw from the, I studied from the Bukharian communities, when you see a good diamonds, you jump in. <laughs> you take the, so on the second date before I proposed, Simantov, you know what I told my wife? Says to me, we're not here to change each other. We are here to live with each other. If you cannot live with me now, we're not going to for each other. If you want to change, why do you have to change me? Yes, the fact that I have to improve to do the Shabbat is 100%, no doubt. But it's not your job. You're not my mother and you're not my teacher. How many times are you going to get into to realize that we're not here to be a boss or to be a father or a mother? We're not here to change anyone except ourselves. Imani ani biglal mishi ani. Pesach. Mazi imani ani. If I am I because of who I am, not because of who you want me to be, because of who I am, then I'm a free person. Then David, I feel and live freedoms. That's another beautiful.
the Kutsk Rebbe, a giant in his generation. The first message is from Eric life is a real to be what? To be free. To be free meaning be unique. The second message is Matzah. Matzah Matzah. What is Matzah? I will tell you what's Matzah. It was once Israeli driver. You know what they said about us? We're not driving fast. We're flying slowly. You know, when you see me driving, after, after you're going out, you make a gomel, shikhiano, anything you want. I'm reading, I don't like to drive fast. I'm flying slowly. I'm always checking the gas, what's the limit? Thank God I'm driving minivan. This Israeli guy, Israeli driver, he went in the truck. He's driving the truck. He's driving the truck and then you see a bridge. And the bridge said 12 feet. He doesn't know if the truck is 12, less or more. How do you check? American person will step the truck on the side and gonna check, gonna open the book. You know what Israel is doing? Push the gas. If I pass, it's less. If I didn't pass, it's more. So the guy is driving, he pushed the gas, at last so the is driving too, and then you hear and in the middle of the bridge, after the roof came open roof, open roof, after the roof went down, he got stuck. Two truck came to pick him. Everybody trying to push the, the, the truck, nobody succeed. And then they saw one rabbi is walking. And they asked, what the rabbi, you study Gemara, you're so smart. Can you tell us the only way to move the truck? We got stuck here. What the rabbi said? Make, take the tire out. Take the tires, pss, the truck will become low, and then you can have two trucks to take it. He took the tire out, the air of the tires, and he took, and the truck came out. Gentlemen, when we get stuck in life, you know why? Because we have too much air. Each one of us full of arrogant balloon. If you get stuck in life, if Shidduchim doesn't work out, if your business is not good enough, if Parnassah, all what you have to do is This is the difference between Chametz and Matzah. Chametz is full of air. You see, the Chala is beautiful. Air. Matzah, the air is out. 18 minutes. In life, all Rabbi, she's not good for me. She is from Bukhara, and I'm from Tashkent. She is from here, and I'm from there. I don't understand. Who gives us this nonsense? She is a good woman, she has a good character, he is a good guy, he has a good character, he follow, follow the footsteps of God. His, his life is amazing. I never went out on a date with this mentality. I went out looking for a woman that's serving God and a good character. Take your arrogance out. Eric was one of the most humility human beings that I met. A beautiful person with zero attitude, zero arrogance. And last but not least, with this I'm going to finish. Pesach symbolizes freedom. Freedom meaning to be who you are. To be real to yourself. To be real to your value. And matzah symbolizes What do you have to do in life? Take the air out. But Rabbi, I'm a good looking guy. I put gel every day. I have a nice suit. Papillon. Take the air out. Less air, more successful. The secret of life is to be matzah. And last but not least is maror. Maror meaning, you know, I asked uh, Eric many times when I was driving with him, how come you're so happy? I mean, you know, being blind all the life, all his life, you know, going with, and he was always the first one in every shiru Torah. And read, you know, Bukharian, the, our tradition, being Bukharian, is always to come late, respectable. Uh, even in a wedding, Shir Torah, Rabbi Chudachat, A2D, we're gonna be here. The only one is here is Rabbi Vaknin and Alex Matatov. The one that organized, and the other one will come to visual. <laughs> okay, Bao Hashem. And I love it when they say Chudachat, look like they mean it. Chudachat, Be'ezrat Hashem, I'm on the way. Chudachat meaning 9, 9.30, 10 o'clock, Bao Hashem. It's all good. Eric was always the first one. In every class, it's always the first one. And not only that, when I ask him, how come you're happy? What's the secret of happiness? Listen to his answer, and this is Maror. Maror meaning to take the bitterness in life and to bless God for it. He said, Rabbi, if this is what God gave me, and this is the tool that God gave me, I have to be happy in what God put me in.
He was always smiling. Me and him used to sing. And when we drive into Safra Synagogue, I have a class in Safra Synagogue for almost 11 years, the biggest uh, uh, single, singing class in Manhattan for 11 years. I was driving with him every class. Two things he was. He was singing on the way. And Rabbi, you have to, you have to find me a wife. Please, Rabbi, I'm waiting for you. I count on you. <laughs> said, this is the two things. We're talking about a wife. And I mean, we're talking about what happiness? Singing in the car. The, I said, Eric, what's the secret? Give me some medicine, you know, genes. Give me some medicine. A medicine of happiness. He said, Rabbi, to accept. But God put me over. To accept with love. You get ticket, don't cry. Somebody went out on a date, and the date was broken. Don't sit the whole night and eat ice cream. Why bad things happen? You, you put music of depression, and you get into the mood, and then you're thinking to jump from Brooklyn Bridge over Razano debate, which bridge is better? Stop. <laughs> Accepting the challenging of God with happiness. Do you know why? Because then I said to remind all of us, God running our life perfect. The fact that you don't see it yet is because you, you don't want to see it. I was waiting 27 years for my life, for my wife. 27 years, I was the last one in the class. You know how many people told me no in the dating area? And every time I, I came out after the date, I said, God, it's all good. You're good, you're good. And we have obstacles in life. And we have nonsense obstacles. Eric had to come every morning knowing that he's blind. Knowing that his capability to move is very, very slow. Knowing that he has to go in with the wheelchairs. Knowing that his life is so much obstacles. And not only that he didn't complain, he was so happy. Pesach, Matzah, Umaru. Yehi Zichur Baruch. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi Lachlan, for the beautiful speech. Now, quick change of plans. There are a lot of people here that do want to say like a quick one, two minute thing for Eric. So we are going according to schedule. We're going to change a couple things up. Right now, we're going to have the movie playing. Then we're going to have afterwards Avi Benjamin speak. We're going to have a couple of Rabbanim that are here for Eric, Rabbi Kaziev, uh, Rabbi Delman, and some others that are here, just for a couple minutes, and then we're going to wrap up with uh, Rabbi Adam. So please give your undivided attention to the movie. I'm going to turn off the lights now, and we're going to do a quick sound check. Good?
he told me, he comes, he grabs me, he says, Tommy, when did when we shake up? And I said, very soon, very soon. I don't know when you shake up, but to, to appease him, I can say, very soon, don't worry, very soon. And he said, because of how I'm sick, I'm, I'm tired of this. I said, what well, are you tired of? I said, he's in my health issues. Because I know I'm a shift of God, I don't want to be healed. I said, that's true. And I asked him, Eric, when the shift comes, would you want him to give you your husband? And, you know, as soon as he answered, he didn't lose my husband. He said, no, I don't want to have my husband. I want to say, I want to say no. I want him to, to, to heal me everywhere else, but I want to say no. I said, Eric, what? He tells me, because I know, I hear of how the struggle it is, the type of struggle it is, people, to not go in your eyes. He said, I don't have that problem. And I don't want that problem. I know how difficult it is. And I don't want that problem. Look out of nothing. Then the third time I came to me, the kids are going to know what? I'm going to put him in jail. I'm going to put him in jail with no conditions. <coughs> and the guy was crying and praying and begging and crying and begging and praying to the security guard. So the kids said, you know what? I'm going to take him out. I'm going to put him in good conditions. I'm going to do a mattress, food, TV, gym, this, that, and that. All the stuff. And what happened with that? All the good stuff? He stopped praying. He stopped coming to us and he stopped begging, he stopped crying. The kids said, oh, he stopped. I'm going to put him back in jail. He was in bad conditions. So what is the other thing you want to mention? That when you think he's really in the bad, you have to keep coming back to him. And next year, you can all sit in this lobby table that is in Africa. Not in America, but in
Wow. יחמול וירחם על נפש ומשמה של הבחור הצעיר שנפטר בשם טוב מן העולם. חמת כונה מולה אריק יצחק בן מאיה ורפאל. רוח אדוני את עניכם ומנהדת תהיה נשמתו אצל עולם וצרור guys for inviting me. Um, if you guys didn't cry during that video, then you must be a very cold person. I uh, had a hard time containing myself upstairs because I think it was, a, it was an exceptional video. I'm going to be very short and sweet. I'm going to say it in English and uh, I'm going to tell you a small story. Over Shabbat last week, I was sitting with this one gentleman. He goes, I got to tell you this story. Now me, I'm, I'm a sucker for good stories. I really like a good story. Why? Because I believe that a good story can change somebody's perspective like that. I'm not observant. I'm not observant. I'm God-fearing. Anybody who knows Eric knows one thing. He had a sense of humor like nobody else. I think if you would have pursued stand-up comedy, it would have worked for him. I would sit in the car sometimes and I used to tell him, you know what, Eric, whoever's in the car with me, I used to drive him back home after the Culture Boys class. I'd be, Eric, I think you're putting on an act. I was like, I know, after this, I'm sure you have somebody waiting for you. I'm sure, I, he, I was like, you're 007, you remind me of James Bond. I was like, I'm sure this is not you. I know Eric in a light, you want to see who a person is? You want to see who a tzaddik is? Show me his parents, show me his students. I'll tell you who he is. Now, I'm sure the parents are wondering, you know what? But you move, why? I'm going to give you a story right now. It's going to clear everything up for you. Everybody who know, knows who the Baal Shem Tov, correct? He's a big chassid, a big rav from Ukraine. So this is the story of the, of the Baal Shem Tov. If I say it incorrectly, I ask for his forgiveness. But I think it'll bring a lot of light to you guys. 
A long time ago, the Baal Shem Tov came to town and there happened to be a Brit Milah. So the Aviyah Ben goes like, oh, the Baal Shem Tov, please, Kvodo, Meimon, you know, take Sandak of my son. He goes like, are you sure? He goes like, of course, the Baal Shem Tov wants me to take the Sandak of my son. He goes like, okay, I'll take the Sandak, but there's two things that are going to happen that day. Something really, really good and something really, really bad. He goes like, do you still want me to come? He goes like, yes, I really do. So he comes. Wedding, I mean, this, this brick was on the highest level possible. Moel, highest level. The shkita was unbelievable. Meat, but yourself, served to you by tikvah, whoever you may have it. Avi parrots, Uri Bitan, whatever you want. All of a sudden, the brick milah is done, and the father, the Avia Ben, has another two children. One of them was cerebral palsy. He dies on the spot. So now the, the father's like, I don't understand. He asked the Baal Shem Tov, he goes like, I call, you, I call you to be the Sandak of my son, you give me good news, and then my other son, Cerebral Palsy, dies? What could have my Cerebral Palsy son did to die? Tell me. He was born like this. He was born like this. I'm sure he was patur for any, any mitzvot, having any obligations. What could he have done? He goes like, you want me to tell you who this person was? I'll tell you. He was like, a long time ago, there was a lady. She had four or five children. And they didn't have enough food to eat. All they were eating was salt and bread. And the kids were like, Mom, you know what? Pesach is coming up. Can you please give us some chicken? Please? Please give us some chicken. So the mother had to work by herself to be able to get this money to buy this chicken. It took her a month to get the money to buy this chicken. And at that time, it's not like over here, you come, the food is ready, you already know it says bet yourself, not bet yourself, kosher, not kosher. If you bought something and it was not kosher, you took the loss. So she goes, she saves enough money to go buy this chicken. She brings it to the shochet, the shochet cuts it. He, sells it. he tells her, this is taref. She was like, what? It's not kosher, I don't know what to tell you. What am I gonna tell my kids? I saved a month of my money just so I can feed them. I don't know what to tell you. A little inconsiderate, would you say? A mother came, almana, a widower, no money. You just dismissed her like that. She went home, told her kids the news. The kids were devastated. Years down the line, all the kids went off of the derech. They lost hope, they lost faith. Time passes by, this shochet comes to the next world, he dies. And the Kadosh Baruch Hu tells him, he goes like, you have an unfinished mission. You didn't take into consideration the feelings of this one person that you heard in this world. He goes like, what? He goes like, yeah, there was a lady. She was struggling. You could have put your hand out, you could have reached out to help her. And you said, you know what? This is Taref. He goes like, you should have been a little bit more lenient. Give a hetero over here. Feel the situation, feel another Jew. That's how important it is. He goes like, you have to do one of two things. One, it's either you come back to this world or you get punished. He goes like, anything but coming back to this world. So how do you think Hashem punished him? Send him back to life as a cerebral palsy boy. In this Brit Milah, this boy is standing. The Shochet is there. And they needed a third person to give Chazakat to see if the meat was kosher enough. So they come up to the cerebral palsy boy and say, excuse me, can you please check this? Is this kosher? He says, yes. He dies on the spot. Sometimes we're looking at a person like, you know what? Miskin bet you It's like that. You don't know who this person is. You don't know who this person is. You don't know what kind of a neshama he has. If you ask me, all these people gathered over here on a Saturday night, I think you as parents did very well for yourselves. You can give them a round of applause. You think about it for a second. What are they saying? That you're da, tzaddik, bakati. Look how many people came through. Everybody knows Eric for learning Torah. If I go out, Bezrat Hashem after 120, I want people to know me like that too. You guys should walk around with your heads high like this. Understanding that there's nothing that we can do to bring him back. But there is something we can do to make it easier on him over there. He left a, an impression on us. I spent some time with him in the car, and I'll be honest with you, I regret one thing that I didn't do with him. He would call me once, twice a week. I'm busy. Yeah, Abby, I'm like, I'll call you back. 
And then one time, you know what? Out of that one time a week when I pick up, he goes like, yo, can you pick me up? I'm like, wait, he goes, I'm come to the class. So I'm like, you know what? You come through, I'm gonna drive you back. So that 20 minutes in the car with Eric was spectacular because I would drive him crazy. I would, first of all, I'd turn on the music, I was like, yo, Avi, man, put on some hip hop, put on good vibes. I'm telling you, this guy, he was a person, and whoever, whoever said that, I think it's uh, Ruben Yitzhak, he said, listen, if I could have my eyesight back, he would always talk about Shmirat Tainai. He would always talk about Shmirat Tainai. I mean, I know that's a fact. He said, I wouldn't take my eyesight back. How many, you think this person was from this world? He can't be. The guy was incapable of doing the majority of the stuff that we're capable of doing, and he still went to shul. I know people that live in the building of a shul, they don't go to shul. This guy is inconveniencing people to go to shul. You're wondering why he stayed here? He didn't belong here. If I was a Kaddish Baruch, I would want him too. What are you talking about? The guy with Shomer Mitzvot went to more classes than classes were given. He went to multiple classes. First of all, anybody ever seen him walk to one time? Who's seen him walk to one time? The guy remembered the way to go there. On Zapomium, on Napaimit to the Chadil. On Yiprost the Chadil, he was by himself. He's walking with a stick. You understand what I'm saying? This is not a regular human being. We're not over here because there was free pizza. We know this guy was a tzaddik. And if there's anybody who can go out in a way like this, I think you should walk around with your head high knowing that I had a son who made an impression. There's people that live a whole life that's empty. Sometimes I ask myself, you know what? I wake up, am I really supposed to go to work? Do I need to? Am I gonna ever have enough money? Is the money that I'm making enough for me now? Because anytime you have something, you always want more. You look at Eric, just by looking at him, he was a symbol of Torah. <laughs> you can learn shots by looking at him. Like, you know what? Kibbutz Abraham, Derek Eretz. Must start, the guys. He would sit down, he would always ask somebody for Chidush. I remember Avi and Asker, when they had this organization called Achdud. They would be with him all the time. Where you at? I'm with Eric right now. I'm telling you, I consider Eric on a very high level, because I don't, I'll be honest, I don't really respect people who claim that they're religious. I don't care if you walk around with a yarmulke on your head, you have a big beard. You don't surprise me. Why? Because I've seen a person walking around with a cane and glasses by the name of Eric who has better midot than a lot of people. That goes to show for you. It's not about where you come from. It's about how you were raised and how you respect the Kaddish Baruch Hu. This person was gifted. To have this many people come and honor him? I don't know too many people who had it like that. They'll come to the Levayada, Ombul Kharosh, Richilarek. Anybody who knows Eric, if you mention Eric's name and you picture him in your mind, there's one of two things you're going to do. You're going to smile. You'll be like, oh, Eric. <laughs> Or you'd be like, you know what? Every time I saw him, it's either at a lecture or in shul. You see him anywhere else? No. So I want to tell you one thing. In life, you may seem upset at a Kaddish Baruch for doing what he does, but we don't know his cheshbonot. We don't know what he does, how he does it, and why he does it. I have a friend of mine, they're in the room. They have this one concept. They say, don't be a tuki. Don't be a tuki. Don't follow everybody. We have free will. Be a human being. You said something to somebody that was bad, say I'm sorry. It doesn't cost anything. You know, in my house, it's, um, it's a very musical house. Very free-spirited. Nobody ever pushed us to do anything. When we went to Yeshiva, like it was normal for us to be able to do Kiddush, and somebody would record the Kiddush. Gromche, gromche, mitzayis lishon, yatez apis, Shabbat. That's how it was. Now, if somebody were to look at me before, they'd go, Asur! Asur! Genom to emigiri! Listen to me, bro. It's my first Shabbos. What do you like? I don't know. It's my first Shabbat. Be considerate of people. Understand that you can say something to somebody, you can hurt them, you can bury them. And I'll tell you, I've learned a lot from Eric, and I'm sure everybody in this room has. Now, we cannot donate enough money to bring him back. But I do want to do something cute. You can't afford to, to donate to his cause? Great. What can you do from yourself to be able to make sure that his neshama, you know, actually feels it? 10 minutes a week, 20 minutes a week, little neshama, Mr. Eric. That's what's going to take him up. Somebody asked, I was at a lecture in, um, in Miami over Shabbat. He says, listen, Rothschild, you know Rothschild? A rich man. He was invited by Princess Diana to the house. He said, listen, Rothschild, you're a wealthy guy. I'm the queen. I think we need to sit down, you know? 
How much are you worth? How much money do you have, Mr. Rothschild? How much am I worth? Thirty trillion dollars. She goes, why are you lying to me? You're insulting my intelligence. I know that you're worth more than me, and I have more than that. He says, what are, you asked me what I'm worth, so I answered you. I'm only worth the mitzvot and the tzedakah that I gave. Everything that I possess, it's not what I'm worth. They are saying, I said in, in hundreds of the classes that we gave, who is rich one who is happy with what he has? Morally, spiritually, and physically. Financially, I know people who are filthy rich. Their kids are off the derech. I know people who live a mediocre life. They have tzaddikim in their house. Tzaddikim in the house. You come inside the house, you say, wow, listen. There is religious, and then there's chudoitas. God-fearing. It's a fine line. It's a fine line. On this note, I'd like to say upon myself that every time I do think about Eric, I try to make myself a better human being. You can't give people your money, you can give them your time. Next time when you see somebody in the situation of Eric who's not as well off as you are, doesn't have money, maybe a little sick, give him your time. I'm sure for Eric, all he needed was a phone call to speak to somebody. Cost nothing. You'd be like, you know what? I got no time. Stop calling me, Bob, Bobo. Time. Give him your time. Talk to him. You know what? How are you doing? There's somebody less fortunate than you. Give him your time. Why? In your mind, hold me. Come on. You know what? There's something that I can do for this person that's not going to cost me money. I'll just give him my time. Without further ado, I think it is, it's only right that if anybody can raise their hand and say, I will take upon myself at least 30 minutes a week. Not a day. 30 minutes a week. To learn Torah. Lilun Nishmat, Mr. Eric. Anybody want to raise their hand? We've got to get more hands than that. So this is what I can show you to the parents. Maya Rafael is with some Yuvalis. Как Бог поступил с вами, вы должны знать, что ваш сын оставил печать, который не говорит, что он был блатной или он был успешный, что он был цадик. И как родителям there's nothing bigger than that in the world. It's gava for the parents knowing my son is a tzaddik. And I'll tell you like this, standing here, I, I, I had plenty of things to do. I would cancel everything to come speak over here. Because he's mamash a tzaddik. Without further ado, give these parents a round of applause they deserve. I thank you very much for Wow. Never cease to amaze us, Mr. Avi. Thank you so much for all those amazing words. Next, I would like to invite Rabbi Delman, one of Eric's close rabbanim. Eric used to spend a lot of time over there uh, for, Shabbat, for Shabbat on weekends, I've heard. And Eric was somebody, uh, Rabbi Delman was somebody that Eric really looked up to. So just for Rabbi Delman to come up for a couple minutes and share a quick chizuk, we'd like to invite you to the stage. So I didn't know I was speaking tonight. I walked in the room and Sarah B said, you're speaking tonight. So I'm speaking. Vishus, the Rabbanim, teachers, everyone's here. Uh, tonight is difficult for me. Tonight is a night of firsts for me. This is the first time in a year that I've been in a room with so many people. We Ashkenazim are a little sensitive with the whole COVID thing. Um, so this is a little weird. This is the first time I've seen so many of you. I've missed you all so much. In my home, for those of you who know, my wife Tova and I, we ran a beautiful little program called Shabbat of the Delmans. And I think I've had pretty much every single one of you in my home at least one time over the last six years. 
And it moves me terribly in a beautiful way, I should say, to see all of you. We've missed you so much. This is also the first time I've ever spoken at a yeshvo before. I'm not sure how this works. I'm not sure whether we're supposed to laugh or cry or maybe a little of both. So I hope whatever comes out is, is the right thing. And finally, and perhaps the most difficult, this is the first time in my life that I've ever had to mourn one of my Talmudim. One of the first times I've ever had to uh, mourn a very, very special person so dear to me. Uh, it's particularly trying because I didn't have a chance to go to the funeral. I wanted to. I was told not to. The time was when COVID was at its height. And uh, Maya and the family encouraged me not to go, although my heart said go. I didn't want to disrespect anybody, so I decided to stay and watch like so many hundreds of people on Zoom. But I haven't really had the opportunity yet to share in a public setting my feelings about Eric. Over these last 15 minutes, just listening to what everybody's saying, I, uh, I had to ask myself, what is the purpose of a yeshvo? I was trying to understand, in, in Ashkenazim we call it a yard site. But like, what's the purpose? Why do we do this? And I think it has a lot to do with Pesach, actually. W why do we do Pesach? Like, what's the point of Pesach? And we have this story about these miracles. Egypt, God took us out. There have been many stories about Jewish people and uh, us being liberated. Uh, by this nation, we could call it the, you know, we could call the Romans, the Babylonians, the Persians, go on and on and on and on. But there's something special about Pesach, that it's a Del it's a, it's a mitzvah in the Torah that we have to observe Passover. Why is this one special from all the other holidays? So I want to posit an answer. I want to share with you a beautiful idea. There have been many, many holidays in which God took us out, but no holiday that was as great with as great miracles in such a huge way, blood, frogs, lice, locusts, darkness, unbelievable. And you know why we have this holiday every year? It's the same story, and again, and again, and again. But what's the reason why we keep telling it? Because if we didn't tell it every year, despite the greatness of the miracles, they would be forgotten. It doesn't matter how great the things that happen. It could literally rain hail the size of station wagons, but we would forget about it had we not talked about it. Eric was a miracle. You know, we define a miracle, if you want to look it up in the dictionary, as something that goes against the laws of nature. Nature tells us that when a person has a set of challenges in life, we don't react this way. It's not normal, whatever the word normal means. People are depressed. I'm a therapist. I know I see these people every day. They're unhappy with life. That is what's normal in a situation for somebody who went through what Eric went through. Eric was a miracle. He went beyond the stage of what's normal. I feel bad because I'm repeating. So many of the points that I think Roy Vachman and all the wonderful other speakers uh, said. So I apologize. But in my mind, there are two things that stick out when I think of Eric, his personality, and, and what his impact uh, on my life was. Number one, as so many people said, was his Simcha Sachan. Eric was just amazing. <laughs> He's just so happy. He's so wonderful. I, I, um, I hear him in my head right now. In my head right now, he's making fun of me because Eric was a New York Rangers fan and the Rangers beat the Flyers last night nine to nothing. He's probably laughing at me right now. It's okay, I deserve it. A lot of people make the mistake and they think that I was Eric's Rebbe. I was not. Eric was my Rebbe. Eric was my family's Rebbe. I remember distinctly a beautiful Shabbos, it was a nice weather. And uh, I was going to walk Eric to shul in the morning, as I normally did. And my son Pinchas, who at that time was maybe 12 years old, said, no, Daddy, I want to walk Eric to shul. And we davened at Chafetz Chaim that morning, and we walked in. People were staring, as often people do when they see somebody who perhaps looks a little different. 
to see the pride, ladies and gentlemen, the pride in my son's face when he walked in arm in arm with Eric, said, this is my friend Eric, and he will sit with me in the base medrash in Chafetz Chaim Yeshiva. The pride that he had. And the chinuch, in Hebrew, the education that Eric gave our family, where my son would say, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't feel like going to the shir this morning, but if Eric can go, I can go too. And that's what he did for all of us. Sorry, my notes. I'll just share one more idea. As I said, I, I, I so much to say. But uh, just to finish up, one other point that I think wasn't discussed as much tonight was the level of achdos and brotherhood that somehow Eric was able to generate. At our house, we had 50, 60, I think one, one Shabbos, we tipped the scales at 100, over 120 people. I think Amner was there, you remember that Shabbos? Unbelievable. Eric had a way of bringing people together. I have a very broad, broad swath of people that come to my house. A lot of Bukharians, some Persians, Ashkenazim, Jewish people, converts, people of different races. Everybody seemed to love Eric. He just seemed to grasp every type of people. He wasn't just everybody's Bukharian's Bukharian. He was everybody's wonderful person who everybody loved. There's a beautiful story that's told about a great, great Hasidic rabbi, somebody by the name of the Klausen River Rebbe. Klausen River Rebbe was known as being a very outspoken fighter, and he used to tell over his story about how he survived the Holocaust. Okay? Now, if anybody here has heard from a Holocaust survivor or spoken to a Holocaust survivor, Holocaust survivors usually come in two fashions. There's usually the kind that never want to talk about it, and then there's the kind that always want to talk about it. Thank God that Klausenberger was one who always wanted to share his experiences. So this is what the Klausenberger told his students. He says, I want you to know there was something that I missed about the Holocaust. There's one thing that I miss about it. The students looked at him with huge eyes. They said, something that you miss? What could possibly have you missed about the Holocaust? The Klausenberger Rebbe lost his wife, lost his children, lost his grandchildren, lost his entire Hasidus. All of his followers were dead. He came to this country and started a brand new movement. What could he have possibly missed? So he said, I miss the death march. So for those of you who don't know what the death march was, I will tell you, because my grandfather was on one of them. The death march was, as the Soviets were closing in on Auschwitz-Birkenau, the Nazis, who were cowards, did not want to stay to face the music. The Soviets didn't take any prisoners. So they ran and they fled with the rest of the Jews that were left in Auschwitz, my grandfather being one of them. And they went on marches towards Germany. And as Jews died from either starvation or freezing cold, they would just drop. Klausenberger was one of these Jews on the death march. So when he explained this to Tamidim, to the students, the students were wide-eyed. And they asked him, what in the world could you have possibly missed about this? So he says, I'm going to tell you right now. He said, you know, when we were on the death march, every Jew looked exactly the same. I was a Hasidic rabbi, but you know what they did? They shaved us. We had no hair. None of us wore white shirts or black pants. None of us wore kippot. We were all skinny, shaved Jews wearing pajamas. And every single one of us stood arm in arm, just like this, seven across, so that whenever somebody got weak and felt that they were going to fall, that we stood arm in arm together. I have never, the Klausenberger ever said, I have never felt that level of achdut, I have never felt that level of closeness where Jews looked after one another despite one being more religious, despite one being less religious, despite one voting for Trump, or voting for Biden, or voting for uh, all the different types of Jews and personalities. Every Jew looked exactly the same and we loved and we fought for each other. He says, I haven't felt that way since the death march. It's hard to imagine such clarity coming from such a time of great tragedy. We all are in this room and we wonder 
how is it that he was able, that Eric was able to manifest this level of happiness and joy? We all wonder, and I wonder them. I wonder as well how he was able to do it. The answer was, Pashtus, as we see simply, he was a tzaddik. He was a very righteous person. I, I look back and I think of all that I had the zuchut and merit to help him, and I say it wasn't enough. I should have been more. We all feel that way. I wish I had it done more. I wish I had a chance more. Right? I just end off by saying probably the sweetest and most simple thing. Every single Shabbat before his mom would pick him up, before I would pick him up, he would say to me, Rabbi, I know I love you. I said, I know. Eric, I love you too. So on the first Yeshua, I'll just repeat those words. Eric, I love you very much. But just remember, I wasn't your Rebbe, you were mine. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Kalman. And now we are at our final speaker for tonight. I would like to invite Rabbi Yitzhak Amanov, one of my favorite lecturers, very up there. And you know, can I just quickly say something? Everybody's here, Motzei Shabbat, everybody has their phones on them. For people to sit down and listen to a lecture without touching their phone, even though they hear it and they feel it buzz, that's a big chidush. That's, a, that's really big in my eyes. I would like to invite Rabbi Amenov, a rabbi that can keep everybody's attention together and a rabbi that can inspire many people in this room to really grow and to to just be a better Jew. Rabbi Amenov. First of all, we would like to say a big thank you to this beautiful event that Alex and his partners put together. All week I've received many phone calls from Alex. How to do this, what should we do here, we should speak. Amash working very hard to make this happen. And you and your organization should continue to grow. You should inspire many, many more Jewish lives. And most importantly, I would like to thank Eric's parents. We knew each other for a very long time. My mother and Eric's mother were actually classmates in Uzbekistan. So we go, we go way back, as they say. And we lived across the street from each other. We still do. And Mr. Rafal, Eric's father, he, during this whole year, came to our synagogue. He moved in to Fresh Meadows. He would pray in our synagogue three times a day. He never missed the filah. He never missed Kaddish. He attended Shiurim. He participated, he got involved. A much tremendous growth this year we saw from the family, from the friends, from loved ones, from the peers. All in the Zuchut of Eric, Yitzhak Matatov. I'm going to be calling him Yitzhak because he, he always yelled at me when I called him Eric. He says, my name is not Eric, my name is Yitzhak, call me Yitzhak. And our rabbis tell us actually that a person's name Tells, tells, a lot, tells him a lot about the person. It exemplifies who he is. Eric, they gave him when he became religious, as, as you saw in the video, his mother was saying. So he consulted with the rabbis and they gave him the name Yitzchak. And I think the name Yitzchak fits Eric very well. We know how Yitzchak Avinu how he received his name. I'm not going to get to the whole story, but Sarah Imenu, his mother, she was laughing when she heard that she'd be giving birth, she'd be having a child, Yitzchak Avinu. So Hashem says, Ah, Sarah, you laughed, Tzachak. Your son, you're going to name him Yitzchak because of laughter. 
And for those who knew Eric, every time he came into a room, wherever he was, all the pictures you saw, all the videos you saw, there was always a smile, there was always, he, he was always laughing. Another way Eric Yitzchak exemplifies his name, we know Yitzchak Avinu at the age of 37 years old, he was willing to give up his life for Hashem. He understood what was going to happen. He, was, uh, he had a mind of his own to not agree. He had the strength to, to come out. But he agreed to give up his life for Hashem. And this is who Yitzchak Matata was. I had a big zakhut to put on to fill in. Every day, every Friday, to Eric, we lived close by, so it was much, much easier. And before, before I left, he would always tell me, where are you going? I said, listen, like you saw in the video, I have to go, it's Friday, I'm going to have my mother. He says, no, no, you cannot leave without telling me a divrei Torah. And he gave me a lot of homework. Every week I had to come prepared with new divrei Torah to tell him. And not like basic things. He was very advanced. You needed to really get into deep stuff. So in his zikhut, I would go, before coming to him, prepare some stuff, because I know he, he wanted to hear the Divrei Torah. And he would go, in his Shabbat table, say over this Divrei Torah. And wherever you went, he would repeat this Divrei Torah. He, in, in, in his own way, did his own kiruv. I always just tell him, Eric, you're my rabbi. What are you saying? I'm not a rabbi. I said, no, Eric, you're my rabbi. And when it was his passing, I lost my rabbi. Eric used to take what's called accessorite to yeshiva. We were also, we, were, we, were, we used to go to the same yeshiva. And for those who know how accessorite works, very difficult, very complicated. You're in a bus, filled with other people that are handicapped. And accessorite goes based on what's closer, what's farther, who made an appointment first. So you could sit in this accessorite for hours. Sometimes it never came on time. Sometimes they didn't even show up at all. But no matter how difficult it was for him to travel from Queens to Farakaway, in this accessorite, after stopping so many stops, he was still the first one in the shiur in yeshiva. When I used to come late, I used to tell myself, if he can get here early, through this whole process, what excuse do you have? As was mentioned, he used to daven in Ornatan, a great synagogue with a great faculty that really helped him a lot and continues to help the family. He used to get to shul and I'm doing shul while telling you this. When I used to come late, I used to look at Eric and someone would tell me, you know, Eric was the first one here today. I used to tell myself, if he's here first, what's your excuse? If it's, it's hard for him to walk, sometimes I would walk him home, he would say, stop in the middle. I need to take a break, I need to take a breather in my legs. If it was hard for him, then what's my excuse? He was a living a certain nefesh. He, he was a living example of self-sacrifice. This is what he personified. And like, like you saw in the video, he loved the Rei Torah, he loved it. When I would drive him back sometimes when accessory didn't show up, I would drive him home from yeshiva. He would say, don't play any music. No shweki, no ham Israel. Play me a lecture. I said, listen, Eric, we were in yeshiva from 9 to 8. Do me a favor. Let's listen to some music. Put me a lecture. I want to listen to a lecture. So in his dechut, with your permission, we would like to say a small divrei Torah that's very connected to Eric. There was a great rabbi, by the name of Natif, Rav Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin. This rabbi one time, write, write, one time wrote that sometimes Hashem 
it expects a certain level from the Jewish nation. He expects a certain spiritual level from Am Yisrael. And if he doesn't see this level getting to part, he takes away a tzaddik in the generation that personifies this character trait that the generation lacks. When I read this piece of Torah, I right away thought of Eric. There were three main things, in my humble opinion, really more, but today we'll, we'll, tonight we'll talk about three main things that I feel Yitzhak Matatov personified, and this is why Hashem had to take him in our generation. Like the Gemara says, sometimes Hashem sees a whole nation, and t instead of taking everyone, instead of taking hundred Jews, he has to take one righteous person. In my humble, humble opinion, I feel this was the case with Eric, with Yitzchak. Hashem took one righteous person instead of taking hundreds of Jews in the midst of a pandemic. There was an encounter, you saw a little a, a, a part of it in the video, that I was with Eric in his house, we were saying Shema. And then after Shema, he would close the Siddur and he would pray on his own. For whatever he wished for, he prayed for his family, for his sister, for his father, for his mother, and for all of us. And he asked me, when is Mashiach going to come? He said, we have to believe he's going to come every day. He's going to come, don't worry. He says, because I'm tired of my, my health issues. And I asked him, I don't know why, it hit my head, I said, Eric, when Mashiach comes, would you, want, would you want your eyes back? And I get goosebumps every time I think of this. And very often I think of this. He said, no, I don't want my eyes back. I said, why not? It's because I hear that it's such a struggle. It's so hard in our generation with guarding our eyes. So many people fall. They look at things they're not, they're not supposed to. It's very difficult. He says, I don't have that problem and I don't want it. Our boys say, do you know in yeshiva, there were people coming in to put on restrictions on the iPhone. Now, what are, for those who don't know what restrictions are, anytime you want to go on a not such a good website, it restricts you from going on because you have to put on a code, and the way this organization works, they put, on, they put in the code for you. It, it prevents you from looking at things you're not supposed to or doing bad things on your phone. Guess who was the first one online to get his phone restricted? Eric Yitzhak Matatov. I used to tell myself, if he can do it, and he doesn't need to, what's my excuse? So these are the words of the native. That Hashem sometimes has to, take, has to take a tzaddik in a specific generation that Hashem sees that lacks a certain attribute. And I feel this was Eric. I, I think if it wasn't for the pandemic, this place would be filled with thousands of people. Just in his 30 days last, I remember last year when we did his 30 days on the Zoom call. Zoom only allows a certain amount of people. The people that were logging in exceeded it. They were texting the, the ones who were organizing it. They said, why can't we log in? Eric personified the midah, Bohev Shalom, Rodev Shalom. He, he was friends with everyone. He would go to, Mrs. Maya, you know, he would go to weddings every night. He said, why are you going to weddings every night? He says, oh, my friend here, my friend there got married, she got married, he got married, she got married. You have so many friends. He was friendly with everyone. He didn't care what level you were on. He didn't care how tall you, tall you were, how short you were, no matter what. And even non-Jews. He used to travel to the city a lot. He was very active, very active. When I felt lazy, I looked at Eric and said, what's your excuse? He was like a living Musar. He was a living Musar. He was a living, living, living Mr. Nefesh, living lesson for, 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 for me. He was my rabbi. 
He used to go to the city and he had friends in the program he attended. They were not Jewish. I say, I'm going out with, with, uh, with my friends in the city. They're not Jewish. I said, be careful, you know, they might take you to a non-kosher place. They might tell you it's kosher. He said, no, 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 no. I pick the places where we go. I make, I make sure it's Jewish, it's kosher. They respect that. I pick it. I make sure it happens right. He said, Eric, you even have non-Jewish friends? Very friendly. Whenever he was in a room and there was a, the, an argument broke out by other parties, he would say, leave, I, I can't be in this room. Come, help me out of here. He couldn't handle the energy of, of fighting, of lack of love. Because all he was, he was just full of joy, full of love. And I feel like Hashem took him in our generation because Hashem felt that maybe our generation lacks this attribute of Ahdut, of Ahavat Hinam. And He took Eric from us that personified this attribute to show us that this is what we need to work on. Lastly, and with this we'll finish, we mentioned how time and time again He gave up everything He can for Hashem. Mamash. Once he became religious, like his mother said, every night, if it was from, from yeshiva in the morning to lectures at night, all the time, no matter what the weather was, always learning Torah. Always giving up from himself for Hashem. There was one time, a boy who loved to play with marbles, And he used to cherish his marbles. He used to clean his marbles. He loved his marbles. He was five years old. One day he says, you know what? I want to put my marbles in a nice vase. So he opens his mom's closet. He's, he's looking for a vase. He finds a flower vase. So he puts his marbles in there. But then he tries to take it out. He's five. And he sees his hand get stuck in there. And he starts to yell, he's calling for his father. Come help me, my hand is stuck. The father is looking, he's trying to pull his hand out, it's not working. He's trying to put some oil to make it softer, it's not working. Water, not working, nothing is working. The father couldn't understand what's going on. Why can't I get my, why can't I get my son's hand out here? So he looks on the bottom, he sees his hand, his son's hand, is clinched with a fist, and he's holding something. He says, oh, I know why I can't take your hand out. Because you're holding it with a fist and the fist is not... Let go. Let, uh, let, let your hand go. And the son answers, I can't let go. If I let go, the marbles will stay inside. So the Maharal, with this story, he says something very powerful. And in Yenei de Yoma, we're coming into Pesach, as the great rabbi spoke about, before Hashem took the Jewish people out of Egypt, He told them to sacrifice a sheep. Korban Pesach. The Maharal asks, why did Hashem ask the Jews, right before leaving Egypt, to sacrifice a sheep? And by the way, every single year, on Pesach, the same energy that possessed at that moment when the Jews left, happens every single year. Which means what? Every year we have the potential to leave our own Egypt. We have the potential to leave our own exile. We all have our own Egypt. We all struggle with different things. And every year we have the potential to leave it. Hashem opens the gates for us. But how do we do it? So the Maharal says, Learn from what the Jews did before they left Egypt. What do they do? They sacrificed the sheep. So what are you telling me? To go now to College Point, order a sheep and to sacrifice it in my backyard? The Maharal says no. Do what the boy didn't want to do. The boy didn't want to let go of the pebbles. That's why his hand was stuck. Sometimes in life when you feel stuck, your parnasa, shiduchim, whatever it may be, health, you feel stuck. The Maharal says, let go. 
Let go from yourself. Take something upon yourself. Give yourself up for Hashem. Sacrifice. And you'll see. You'll come out. There was a family, an Israeli family, with the story will conclude, that immigrated from Israel to New York. Traditional family. They found themselves in a very observant neighborhood. So they're living in this neighborhood and they feel very left out. Why? Because the man on, Sh on Shabbat goes to shul. This Israeli family, they didn't do that. They saw the wife go to Tehillim classes. This Israeli family, the wife didn't do that. They saw the kids go into a bus to go to yeshiva. This Israeli family, they didn't have such a thing. They felt very left out in this new neighborhood that they moved into. So Baruch Hashem, the neighborhood was very uh, welcoming, very loving. So they decided to help the family out. They took the father to shul one day. They took the wife to the Hillam classes, the hala parties. They took the kids to Sunday school, uh, Hebrew school. Little by little, six months to a year, this Israeli family, Baruch Hashem is keeping Shabbat. The kids are going to yeshiva. The mother is dressing modestly. But there was one mitzvah that the wife, she just couldn't accept upon herself. She just couldn't. She says, I'll do anything you want. I'll keep Shabbat five hours later. I'll keep Shabbat five hours earlier. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do. But to keep this particular mitzvah, I'm not, I can't. What was the mitzvah? Covering her hair. She couldn't. She wasn't able to. My hair, how can I cover it? One day she finds herself in a lecture. A Rebbitzin was speaking on the topic of covering your hair. And the Rebbitzin spoke beautifully, inspirational, strong. And this lady sitting there, she's saying, you know, maybe I need to start to give up myself for Hashem. Maybe I need to break myself. Maybe I need to sacrifice something. You know what, I'll start slow. Twice a week, I'm gonna accept upon myself to cover my hair. And she did. She finds herself the first day going to the wig store. She purchases herself a very modest wig and she puts it on. She said, every Monday and Shabbat, I'm going to cover my hair. Comes Monday, she buys the wig, she puts it on. She feels good about herself. And she goes to the bank. She goes to the bank to, to deposit some money. Ten minutes later, a man walks in with a gun, with a mask, and he yells, this is a setup, this is a, uh, uh, a hostage, everyone down, I'm taking your money. Everyone is screaming, yelling, crying, they get down, and this man is collecting the money, putting all the money in the bag. As he's about to exit, he hears sirens. He knows. He can't come out of here alive. Or at least safe. So what does he decide to do? Take someone hostage. And who does he take? This Israeli lady. He takes this lady. He says, come with me. Don't move or else I'm going to shoot you. He comes out of the door. Comes out of the bank. He shows the cops. If you do anything to me, I'm pu pu putting a bullet in her. She's... We can only imagine what she's going through. He gets close to his car and he tells her, open the car door. She says, I can't. You're holding my hands together. Let go of my hands, I'll open the car door. So you can imagine the scene. He has a gun, bag of money, and he's trying to balance it out, holding her with holding the, the rest of the things. So what does he do? He grabs her by her head. And at that moment, true story, at that moment, what goes on to her mind? Split second. She says, Hashem, it was very hard for me. I did something to break my nature. I did something I thought I'd never be able to do. I took upon myself to cover my hair. Big sacrifice. Just like I broke nature for you, Hashem. Please, break nature for me. 
Let me come out of here alive, not harmed, without anything wrong. Please, Hashem. I did for you, now your turn to do for me. And at that moment, an idea popped into her mind. To unclip her wig, to duck down, and to run. And that's exactly what she did. She unclips her wig, she ducks down. This man is holding the wig. He's shocked. She runs to the cops. The cops were able to shoot his leg. They get him down. They took him to jail. Yeah. This woman gets up there in her shul, in other places. This story becomes very famous. And she says, when you sacrifice for Hashem, when you do something that's difficult for you, it's guaranteed for Hashem to break nature for you. It's guaranteed for Hashem to let you go of your exile. But what do you have to do? You have to sacrifice. Let's take this message, and this is Eric's message. That no matter what I have, no matter struggles, no matter what kind of struggles he had, he was able to, he wasn't able to, it was difficult, it hurt him, no matter the weather. He, every single day, gave up for himself, every single day sacrificed for HaKadosh Baruch And this is a big message that Bezat Hashem, we take upon ourselves. It should be a great Nahat Ruach for him. Thank you so much for your attention, both of them. Amen. 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 Thank you everyone for coming. No, we already did it. No, no, no. That's it. Thank you everyone for coming today. It was a really big honor. And I hope everyone has a great night. I hope everybody was inspired and was uh, really left an imprint on them tonight. Shabbat to everybody.